how much effort do we have to put in into improving the technology over time? So initially we have to put in a lot of effort to get a small performance improvement. Then we start actually getting to a point where we don't need to put in as much effort to get those big performance gains. And then we reach some kind of performance limit, some kind of uh, limit of the technology where, you know what, doesn't matter how much more effort we're not going to get a more fancy technology. Um, now, in this particular pa in paper, Suarez and Manzola, they do a little sleight of hand, which I actually said in the lecture we should not do, but they do it in this paper just to signal it to you, that they replace effort with time. So here in their world, they just call this time, and they say over time, we expect initially it takes a long time for performance to improve, then performance improves, and then at some point in the future, it doesn't improve very much. So they're actually assuming a straight line between um, time and effort to make that work. So they're a bit naughty in that they're not strictly using the uh, technology uh, improvement S curve as they should be. They do say so in the paper, to be fair, but just to kind of signal to you that that's the difference. The other S curve they use is the technology diffusion S curve. This one's to do with the market and the takeoff in the market. We again met this one exactly in the class. We called it the technology diffusion S curve. They call it the pace of market evolution. So the last one, they call it the pace of technology evolution. Slower, faster, slower. This one they call the pace of market evolution. Slower take up, then more rapid take up in the market, and then eventually we get to 100%. And we showed these curves. Remember, we have curves for telephones and for dishwashers and all these other types of technology. We actually looked at that uh, earlier on in this class. So this curve is exactly the same as the one we talked about it. They just call it something different. So what do they do? They go crazy with curves, basically. They say, they try to understand when R, and this is where I've got F, S, A, and I should have F, M, A. So there's no weirdness there to make this thing. Where the first mover advantage is strongest. And they basically argue that we need to understand the strength of first mover advantages in the context of how quickly is the technology developing and how quickly is the market developing. Now we have done that all the way through this course. We've actually been using these ideas, but we haven't been putting it into a curves kind of framework. That's what we're doing in this paper. And they basically say, look, some technologies, they develop like this. It's very abrupt. You get started, and there's really big improvements until you get to the maximum performance. It all happens quite quickly. Whereas other technologies, you can churn away for a long, long, long time before you get that uplift in performance. And the uplift in performance may not be that dramatic. And they call this one a smooth curve, and they call this one an abrupt curve. So this is abrupt technology change, this is smooth technology change. And they basically argue, in which of these, um, in which of these setups do they think first mover advantages are strongest? In a smooth setting or in an abrupt setting? In a smooth setting. They say first mover advantage is more important in a smooth setting. Correct. Yeah. Do you remember why? Does anybody remember why? It's the right answer. Why would you expect first mover advantages to be more important in a smooth setting compared to a fast setting? Did it adapt? Is it, I think you're right, just tell me a bit more. Uh, like the smooth uh, thing is like you need to get adapt to like whatever is there. So mm -hmm. it takes time mm -hmm. and after a while like you like increase it. Exactly, exactly. So that's one, that is one reason, for sure, it is one reason. If you think about it, if, if technology is evolving very abruptly or very rapidly, that might be true for the particular solution that you've chosen, but it's also true that the first mover has chosen, but it's also true for all the solutions that other people are choosing as well. So because technology is evolving very rapidly, you might get an advantage initially, but then you can expect that others would also get advantage in all the related or the competing technologies. So that you're less likely to keep that benefit to yourself. So if you think of um, PDAs, the example that uh, Melissa Schilling had in the textbook, if you think of PDAs uh, and how, is this boring you? I'm seeing around a third of the class either on um, cell phones or on computers and not apparently. Are we okay with this? Yeah? I can just see more texting than usual going on in the class. So if, with this situation, we've got an abrupt performance increase it's abrupt for the first mover, but it's also abrupt for the fast follower. So the fast follower can abruptly move to a higher
high level of performance, which means you're less likely to have those number advantages. Compared to the steady, where it's more incremental, relative improvement, and you're on that kind of path. Let's think about it the other way. Pace of marketing evolution, he says the same, you can have a smooth and you can have an abrupt. This, remember, is number of buyers. So this is about the take up in the marketplace. Where are you more likely to have um, first mover advantages? Where the market evolution is smooth or where the market evolution is abrupt? Again, it's smooth. If it is smooth, that's the correct answer. Anybody remember why? It's almost like the same thing, like consumers will move on quickly. Yeah, that's one, that's, so that's one reason absolutely is that the consumers move on quickly. Like the overall time scale is shorter, so your advantage is shorter. The flip side of that is to think of if there's rapid take up in the market, it means that there's more resources available. In the sense that there's more consumers paying for the service, there's more resources available uh, that they're competing over. So, what he basically says is that FSA is the strongest here, where both are smooth. And Sorry, not FSA, it's FMA, I need to correct that. First number of advantages are strongest here and weakest in the opposite case. Strongest saver. And then in between, you've got this weak effect where you have to look at the details because these two things are interacting. Okay. So what it looks like a complex figure is actually very simple. It's actually very simple. All right, let's see how well you understand. I'm going to give you a few, more, a few moments here. How strong are FSAs in mobile payments and in car clubs? Where does zip car go? Where does, let's say, orange bar car? Give you a few moments to see if you can logic it out and try and understand which of these quadrants would have to come, which of these quadrants would. 